Good morning and welcome to the ninth meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2019. Can I ask everyone in the room please to ensure that their phones are off or on silent and while it is acceptable to use mobile devices for social media purposes, I would ask you not to record or photograph the proceedings. Uh, we have received apologies this morning from Sandra White, MSP. The first item on the agenda is support, subordinate legislation and consideration of a negative instrument. The National Health Service Superannuation and Pension Scheme Scotland Miscellaneous Amendments Regulations 2019. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered the instrument. It did so on the 5th of March 2019 and determined that it did not need to draw attention of the Parliament to this instrument on any grounds within its remit. This uh, instrument relates to uh, pensions within the NHS, among other things. And can I uh, invite Dave Stewart to comment? Good morning, convener. Uh, while this may seem quite technical and remote, um, I'm quite concerned uh, about this particular issue. Uh, for members that haven't followed it in detail, uh, the key issue is that employer contributions will rise by 6% um, in next month. And it, the reason for that is it's um, a change in the discount rate. So the lower the rate, uh, the higher the level of funding required. So the rate's dropping by 0.4%. So probably the key issue is will the Scottish Government um, receive a full Barnet consequential for this? And I'm sure members have all seen the correspondence, particularly from GPs and GP practice. I mean, we've, I think we're all concerned about recruitment and retention of, uh, of GPs. So I'm particularly concerned about this, and rural areas are particularly affected. So the effect could be um, and redundancies in GP staff. Uh, the other issue that could happen, and again, this happens across Scotland, is some GP practices are reverting to health board uh, control. Uh, and I think this will have a major problem for the recruitment and retention of GPs. But of course, it's wider than this, and, and I think my colleague Miles Briggs might want to talk about the, the child's issue. Uh, but there's particular issues among non-NHS uh, employers, such as in hospice, um, in charities, and in universities. Charles wrote to us just the other day to say that it's going to cost them 350,000 extra per year, which is equivalent uh, to nine full-time uh, nurses. Now, I do appreciate, convener, these are all reserved issues, but it has a huge effect on Scottish Government and in health. And the wider issue, just to set the scene, is the other factor that's affecting um, GPs and consultants in particular is the changes to the lifetime allowance, which is a, a UK pension restriction. So basically what this does uh, is once individuals are through the ceiling, uh, is an adverse tax effect on them in the longer term. So, and certainly my own experience going around GP practices in Highlands and Islands is this is certainly affecting the ability of GPs to work be, and consultants to work beyond 55 or to work at more reduced hours. And of course, we all know we desperately need full-time GPs as well as part-time GPs uh, as well. So I don't, I suspect there's not much this committee can do about this factor, but I think it's really important we highlight this because we can all see this coming. We're facing a GP uh, crisis in Scotland um, the employer contributions will affect this, the lifetime allowance is going to affect this, and there's other tax issues which we're the committee with which is also affecting them. But I feel really concerned about the effect on GPs, and I'm very concerned about the effect on non-NHS uh, employers, particularly hospices. We all have, I'm sure, hospices in our area. I know my own one does a fantastic job in, in Inverness, um, but I am very concerned about the extra costs um, and I think in England they treat it slightly differently. So I just put these things on the table um, to highlight my real concerns about recruitment and retention. The point is uh, well made and well understood. We have until the 29th of March to report on this instrument, so we have the flexibility to continue this and seek further information. Uh, Miles uh, Thank you, convener. I'll reinforce what our resident uh, pension expert has just said. Um, I think it is important that we do maybe take some time out, because there was a president set in 2004, um, around the proposed increase then and additional funds being um, set aside to support non-NHS uh, direct employers. So I think it's important. My understanding is that in England and Wales that actually they'll be included in the scope of funding provided um, to take account of these additional costs, but we haven't managed to get clarity from the UK government or the Scottish government on that. So I would like us to take a bit more time to see if we can um, get those assurances um, ahead of next week maybe. Okay, thanks very much. I'll call him. Just to add my support to what David Stewart has raised, this has been raised independently with me, with constituents uh, and GP practices, and I agree that uh, I have an anxiety just nodding this through without an understanding as to where, from where this money is expected to come. Okay, 
Thank you very much. Are there other comments? I see nodding heads around the table. I would therefore propose that we uh, uh, write to the government and ask for uh, uh, urgent reassurances or reassurances as early as they can provide them uh, and as far as they can provide them in relation to uh, these costs being covered uh, and um, thereby mitigating the impact of the changes on uh, recruitment and retention, both in general practice and more widely. And we will return uh, to that uh, hopefully with that information from the government next week. Okay, thank you very much, uh, colleagues. The next item on the agenda is an evidence session on the committee's inquiry into health hazards in the healthcare environment. As colleagues will know, this arises from issues at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Uh, recently, there have been such issues over a period since its opening in 2015, which have raised concerns regarding patient safety. And the committee agreed on the 29th of January to inquire into health hazards in the healthcare environment across Scotland more generally. Uh, we issued a call for written views and received 27 responses. Uh, today we have an oral evidence session on the inquiry and we will of course uh, consider our next steps uh, following that session. But uh, I'm pleased to welcome to the committee today uh, Ian Brodie, the Director uh, Scotland of the Health and Safety Executive. Uh, Alice Delaney, Delaney, a Director of Quality Assurance at Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Uh, Jim Miller, Director of Procurement Commissioning of Facilities at NHS National Services Scotland, responsible for Health Facilities Scotland. And Philip Kaiser, Director of Public Health and Intelligence, also NHS National Services Scotland, responsible for Health Protection Scotland. Uh, welcome, gentlemen, to the committee. And um, we, uh, if I can start off with a question uh, for Philip Kaiser, uh, really, to get us underway, uh, and perhaps other colleagues as well, uh, which is uh, to ask what, how far it is possible to identify from uh, the current systems of health protection and uh, management, how far we can judge the level of morbidity and mortality associated with the built environment in the NHS in Scotland. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I think the first thing to say is, obviously, we are inherently dealing with a very dynamic situation. And, I, and I'm not just talking about in this point in time. I'm talking it, is a, it will always be a dynamic situation. The nature of the threat from health care associated infection changes uh, over time. The, you know, it's inherent in any microbiology that we have a degree of evolution. Uh, what we do with patients is changing over time and what we do with the built environment is changing uh, over time. I think it's important to look at the, the longer term, uh, and Scotland has a very strong track record uh, in the longer term. We have made significant advances, certainly over the last 10 years, in reducing the burden from uh, healthcare-associated uh, inf infection. And there's no evidence at this point in time to suggest that we're seeing any significant increase. Now, obviously, there have been uh, some significant high profile and indeed tragic uh, incidents uh, of late that obviously uh, have, have merited this uh, hearing today. Uh, but in taking in the broader picture, uh, there is nothing to suggest that uh, there is any uh, significant change or increase uh, uh, as, a, as a whole. And I think it's worth saying as well that uh, in terms of international benchmarking, not just not just over time, but internationally, Scotland does very well. Our, and, and, it's, and we can say that with a degree of confidence as well. And the, the monitoring systems in Scotland uh, are, in some ways, a lot more comprehensive than they are in other countries. And even within a UK context, they are they are more comprehensive. You know, we have a point prevalence survey that we we undertake uh, uh, every five years. That is a, an extensive survey. Uh, we have an annual report and we have quarterly updates. And at the moment, when you look at those in the round, there is no uh, suggestion that there is a significant change. Now, that's not to say that there may not be. There's always that possibility that, uh, that things could go in the wrong direction. But certainly there's no uh, indication uh, of that at this point in time. Thanks very much. I think the uh, uh, report that you provided to the committee suggested 48 uh, HAI infections arising from 
uh, the healthcare environment over a three-year yeah. period. Do you do you believe that that is a that that has captured this, the the scale and range of issues it, arising? It's a it's a difficult one to be precise on, uh, to be honest, because how do you define uh, an incident in respect of whether or not it has originated from the healthcare uh, built environment? It depends on how you want to define that, because if it's about an inherent design fault, uh, or is it about the way the built environment has been used or maintained? Uh, so it's difficult. So it, indeed, that is a question I have asked. What you know, as a proportion of the overall incidents, what does, what is 48? Now the answer to that is that that is about 10%. Uh, but others might take a different view and say that there are other incidents that might be attributable because you can never isolate and just say it's so that incident happened solely because of the built environment. There will always be an element of 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 maintenance and, and, and sort of process uh, in there. So it's a, it's a difficult one to be, to be precise on, but certainly the team in Health Protection Scotland, in terms of incidents directly attributable to the, the sort of built environment, believe that it's 48 is their best estimate of that, uh, which is about 10% of the total. Your published report on Queen Elizabeth Hospital highlighted uh, uh, issues around water systems and uh, what, the safety of water. Um, some of our witnesses have also suggested that ventilation systems and uh, cleanliness and cleaning rotas and systems uh, are very significant as well. Looking at that group of 48 identified cases, uh, would you be able to estimate what proportion of those are water-based, what proportion ventilation-based, what proportion uh, arising from issues of cleaning or cleanliness? Specifically, in terms of that 48, no. Uh, I, I would have. To, I could provide. We could provide that information if uh, the committee wanted that information. Certainly, uh, be helpful. What would be your general? Yeah. I mean, uh, it is. I think it is worth saying that uh, because of the instance involving both water and ventilation, uh, work has been done in terms of looking at broader research internationally to look at the the, the burden as a as a consequence uh, of both water and ventilation systems. Okay, thanks very much. George Adam. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, Philip, can I just say, you you said that Scotland has a very strong record, particularly over the past 10 years in this issue and infection control. And you also said when you uh, do international benchmarking, we do really well as well. So my question would be quite simple. Compared to the rest of the developed world, what is it that Scotland does differently in infection control? Uh, are we doing better in certain areas or are we uh, on the par with the rest of the developed world? We certainly we, we do better uh, on, on the whole. If you look at the figures, we, at the moment, we, we have a very strong ra uh, record. I mean, I've, I've got some figures uh, with me around the, uh, looking at this sort of European picture, and we're certainly right up there amongst the very, the very best uh, on, a, on a European scale. But in terms of what, what is it that Scotland does well, uh, I think it's, it's about how the different agencies work together, which obviously I think is very pertinent to obviously the discussions here today. So, and a lot of this does go back in history to obviously to uh, events, for example, like the Vale of Leven, uh, and, and lessons that were learned from that, and how, how different agencies have worked, worked together. So, uh, Health Protection Scotland worked very closely with Healthcare Improvement Scotland uh, through things like the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, advising on different bundles of, of, of care improvement around uh, healthcare associated infections. Uh, and the work of the Scottish Patient Safety Programme is, is well known. So that's obviously one of the key factors in terms of how across agencies uh, we've been able to come together uh, to address this. And an another factor clearly as well is, I mentioned uh, uh, the very extensive monitoring uh, that, that we have and reporting uh, that we uh, in insist on from, from boards, uh, which, is, which is mandatory reporting, it's not optional. Uh, so the, uh, the Health Infection Incident Assessment Tool, HIAT, uh, which I think we referred to in our, our evidence, uh, you know, boards have to submit that. And indeed, we've tightened that up. And I think the other, we, we've created, a, a, I suppose, a learning system, if you like, uh, in so much as if you look even just at the most recent events and concerning uh, some of the incidents connected with water, we already have in place an action plan of things that are, are going to happen. We, we don't wait until we have some extensive formal review. We actually have a learning that we get on and start to put in place things. And again, it's a multi-agency. It's not Health Protection Scotland sitting in isolation. It's Health Protection Scotland working with Health Facilities Scotland and with Healthcare uh, Improvement Scotland. 
So that I can get a, a scale, you mentioned the figures that you've got compared in Scotland to some of the Europe. Do you have these figures you said you had them? I, I, I have them, but I'd rather not, because they're difficult to put in context, right. and it's probably better it, if, if it's something that's shared. Us. Again, we can, we can provide those figures. No, that'd be excellent, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, everybody. I'm interested in the aspects of infection control because it's complex because we have moulds, bacteria, viruses. It's a complex issue and the isolation precautions or standard precautions in the way that we look at managing modes of transmission is uh, it, it, it's complicated. And I'm wondering how the agencies all work together um, to make sure that you the expertise is shared and uh, that there is crossover of knowledge but support of each other because health in, in infection prevention is actually quite a, a, a difficult task, I think, right now. Who would like to... Uh, Alistair Delaney. Yeah, thank you. I think it's really important that, for example, if we take the inspections that we do, um, we use the standards that are created um, by Health Protection Scotland to, um, to guide what we look at. If we then go out and we need specialist expertise, say, because we come across um, certain issues in a particular place, then we would obviously collaborate with that specialist expertise so that we can understand it better. We can work together on improvement programmes thereafter and in terms of the recommendations and advice to our board about how to improve. So I think it's really important to understand the interrelationships between us. We don't have to all be in the one place to do that, but I think it's absolutely essential that we share information, we share intelligence and expertise so that we can work together when we identify something. Any other witness like to add to that? I suppose I'd, I'd like just to come in, in terms of uh, the, the, the role of Health Protection Scotland and being that sort of focus for knowledge around the, that complexity that you talk about in terms of the, the, the particularly around the microbiology uh, and, and keeping that sort of critical mass of, of uh, knowledge around that and how in the, the uh, healthcare environment you, you know, in terms of pra best practice, so we do have a, a team of, with some considerable expertise, we've got uh, a number of uh, nurse consultants who are uh, well respected across the uh, infection prevention community, uh, who are, are seen as the go-to place for, for advice. I think that is, that is one of our strengths, that we, have, that we have that sort of critical mass of knowledge. Thanks very much. Ian Brodie, the Health and Safety Executive, sits a little to one side of the Scottish Government agencies uh, sitting beside you. Could you explain how you, how and when you get involved uh, in issues uh, 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 around this topic? I think on that, on that last question, um, I was going to come in and, and say something there is we, we do obviously have, for example, agreements in place with Health Improvement Scotland, um, because you're right, as a healthcare acquired infection is a very complex area. And um, I mean to make sure that on a case by case basis that we either collaborate, cooperate or, or respect each other's boundaries so we can undertake our work. Um, I think in terms of our written submission, um, summarised most of our position on this in terms of we are a, a GBY regulator and we do have an interest in health and safety in the workplace and work related health and safety across the board. Um, if we're talking specifically about healthcare acquired infection and um, where our, our remit stretches and where our policy and application of our law stretches would not normally delve into th matters of clinical care uh, and also matters of um, um, patient care um, and that's in clinical judgment. Um, so it's that clinical judgment and clinical care is something that we don't stretch our, our legislation into um, but others are, are obviously involved in that particular arena. And in terms of regulatory remit, um, we, we recognise that other regulators are often best placed to deal with certain matters, and that includes healthcare acquired infection, hence the, the agreement in place with Health Improvement Scotland, which is probably the most pertinent point here. Thank you very much. And finally, perhaps Jim Miller, I don't know if you would like to comment at this stage. Uh, clearly, issues around uh, the built environment are central to your role. Can you explain how your remit uh, 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 dovetails with those of your colleagues at the table. Um, uh, certainly. Uh, I think really just uh, uh, building on uh, colleagues' comments, Health Facilities Scotland uh, is an advisory body that sits within National Services Scotland, um, working with health boards, uh, providing a range of uh, technical advice and guidance, um, some of which is uh, very specific to, um, to aspects of estates and facilities uh, maintenance, some of which will be uh, uh, done in partnership with, um, for example, Health Protection Scotland or others where there's um, a potentially a, a, an overlap between 
um, the management and use of the state as well as the, the creation of, of the built environment. Thank you very much. Emma? Yeah, no, I think um, it is important to make sure that people understand that there is it's a complex issue how to manage a hospital. My background is clinical education as a, as a former nurse in a former job. So I'm looking at how, how do you, um, I guess, support building a new hospital, for instance? Are we putting the right equipment, supplies, um, environment in place? How much of an influence do... I guess, do you set when we're working with contractors and looking at building a new hospital like DGRI in the south of Scotland? Jim Miller. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, 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 the Health Facility Scotland as an organisation um, is an advisory body. Uh, the, the decision to commission a large scale uh, or indeed a, 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 any a sizable hospital, hospital would be for that territorial board. Um, these things don't happen very often, and as you've indicated, they are they, they, they provide a very complex built environment once they're there. So I think the boards do draw on um, a wide range of experience and expertise wherever possible. Um, the organisation that I represent uh, does provide uh, advice in a collegiate way through other um, uh, senior estates and facilities colleagues within health boards as well as uh, infection control colleagues. Um, that primarily is done through what's called the Scottish Health Technical Memoranda, which is a range of documents that provides um, current guidance, uh, which reflects uh, best practice at that time across, um, uh, across a range of the, the, the environmental conditions. Um, those memoranda in themselves are um, uh, tend to be derived from uh, UK level uh, guidance, uh, but made pertinent to the particulars of the Scottish environment. Okay, Phil Kaiser, do you want to add anything at that? On that Other point? than just to say, obviously, we work very well. Health Protection Scotland works very closely and, and contributes to the development of the guidance with uh, Health Facilities Scotland. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks, David Stewart. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. I've got a few questions on monitoring and surveillance. Uh, the first question is, can the panel confirm or deny that the only routine proactive testing for contamination of the physical environment is for Legionella? Uh, I'm, I'm not able to, to answer that. Sorry, I don't have that information. Anyone else? This, was, uh, this is based on a submission from yes. one of the NHS territorial boards. I mean, effectively, the question arose from evidence that we uh, received from NHS Fife, who basically have confirmed in their view that the only routine proactive um, work that's been carried out is for Legionella. So clearly I was trying to find out whether this is unique to their board, whether there's any Scottish Government view in this, or whether there's more proactive work being done. If not, of course, if panel members want to write back to us with further information that would be very usefully uh, received by the committee. Me coming in and making a comment there. Um, Legionella is obviously a, a specific American or organism which is prevalent not just in, in, in healthcare but elsewhere and there's a specific set of standards which we do enforce linked in as a proof code of practice linked to the management of Legionella and water systems so we'd expect Legionella to be monitored and it's, it's one of the one of the particularly unique uh, microorganisms of this committee is interested in that we do have a, an interest in so um, it is monitored and actually we, we did some research um, before coming here today and we don't actually have um, a record of any um, Legionella outbreak that we've had to intervene on in uh, NHS premises and healthcare um, premises in Scotland. Thanks, can I maybe move on and um, maybe get a question that I get more feedback from the <laughs> panel. Um, in the panel's view, are boards only aware of contamination in building services once patients are infected? From a Health Protection Scotland perspective, yes. You know, in terms of the, what, is, what comes into Health Protection Scotland, uh, and I, I will need to check because I am very thoughtful about the, that previous question. Uh, that, as far as I'm aware, we don't receive any uh, reports or data uh, around any sort of proactive mm. testing of the environment for uh, uh, for microorganisms of any, of any particular mm. sort. But as far as Health Protection Scotland is concerned, the data we receive is about incidents involving patients. Mm -hmm. Right, that's very useful. That's really the point I'm trying to yes. draw out. Do any other panel members wish to contribute? Right, thank you. 
But I think just, just to say that we use that data then to obviously do proportionate and risk-based scrutiny thereafter. So um, the data that we have access to, both in terms of the national data that's been mentioned, but yes. also there's local data which we request when we have targeted sure. an area, yeah. um, would therefore help us to target where we actually yeah. go. I'm sure panel members can pick up the theme of my questions. It's, it's about being proactive and not just wait until we've got outbreaks. Um, and I just, I'm just one, one correction, if I may. The, you, you could look at the point prevalence survey that is done every five years. The methodology for that is different. Uh, mm -hmm. It is focused on uh, surveying the incidence of potential infection in, mm. in patients. Mm. So there is more of a proactive, but that's a a comprehensive survey that's undertaken every five years. It does have a very significant influence in terms of shaping policy right. going forward. Uh, so there is just, just I think, just for point of clarification, there is right. a proactive element of that survey. But it's it, again, it is focused on infection on the patients, not that, that necessarily that a patient is suffering from, because a lot of the microorganisms that cause infection, uh, most of us in this room will have mm. uh, yeah. those microorganisms in us today. Uh, but it's it's people who are susceptible that mm -hmm. have issues uh, yeah. with such uh, infection. One of the points that has been made to us by a witness is that point prevalence studies, while clearly valuable, do not capture uh, the infection burden of outbreaks because outbreaks, by definition, are episodic and therefore they give a kind of underlying status rather than dealing with the, the, the high hazard. Is that, you, you, you acknowledge that? Is, is that but something? But the, the, the outbreaks are captured through our sort of I mentioned the uh, HIAT, uh, the Health uh, in Infection Incident Assessment Tool, which uh, boards have to report. So if there is an outbreak, uh, and, in, and I say recently we have uh, tightened that, I think 2016, uh, I think, because uh, there's different categories, there's green, amber and red, there's a classification system that goes with that tool, depending on the severity uh, of the outbreak. Uh, I think we tightened it up in 2016, so all green, even green rated uh, HIAT uh, assessments are reported. So that all goes into, you know, we have our quarterly figures that we report uh, and we have our annual survey. Uh, and as, as we said, Healthcare uh, Improvement Scotland use that to guide their inspection regime. Okay. Um, could just move on, and I think this touches on the point you've just made, is can surveillance systems be used to prevent outbreaks infections from occurring in the first place? I'm doing really well with stumping the panel today, I can see that. <laughs> I think, you know, I, I, I think that would be a question that would have to be posed to somebody who's a deep expert in the, in the topic. Mm. It's something that's out with my uh, technical uh, uh, knowledge of, of that, that topic area. Uh, it, it's, a co I think that is a, co it's a complex question, which uh, I think would have a complex mm. answer. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say I could, I could give you, I'm certainly not in a position mm -hmm. to give you an answer today. Uh, it's an answer that I can certainly take yeah. away if, and we could provide a view uh, mm -hmm. on that if that would help yeah. the, the committee. When, when you say we would need to ask somebody with a, a deep knowledge, are you, do you mean a, a microbiological uh, level of understanding? What, what is it that you don't have that we need to uh, access yeah. in order to get an answer to that question? I mean, what, what, so if I can be clear, what you're asking is, is there a sort of a, a proactive testing regime that you could put in place to uh, control uh, or, or prevent uh, outbreaks? Yeah, and I think that, that in simplistic terms, I think some of my colleagues have touched on this already, is his first point of call would be the, the construction of new hospitals. I mean, are we getting this right? What's world evidence on this? Secondly, what's the surveillance system like? And the panel already touched on the fact, by definition, many people in hospital um, have more impaired immune systems, so more vulnerable to any potential infections that might not affect some of us here who perhaps have stronger immune systems. So putting all these things together, is there more we can do to be proactive, to prevent these outbreaks and to prevent death and injury in hospitals in the future? I suppose that's the key points I'm trying to identify. I mean, certainly the, there is, uh, the, and there always will be more that we can do because realistically, uh, uh, delivery, whilst we should aspire to, to attain zero incidence, the, the reality is that is uh, not deliverable in, in reality uh, because, as I say, the nature of the, the, the threat is continually mm -hmm. changing. Mm -hmm. 
unquestionably, you know, when we come to look at the design uh, of, of hospitals, and again, I say we, are, it's not something, I mean, Health Protection Scotland are involved in it in terms of providing expert mm. in, input. So it's a collective exercise in provi providing that mm. sort of guidance that we, we are always working closely with yeah. Health Facility Scotland to see how we can uh, improve yeah. that. So there is, there is already an element of proactivity. I suppose where I'm getting slightly uh, confused is there's, there's that proactivity in terms of influencing and shaping guidance, mm -hmm. which uh, is ongoing all the time. So, for example, I mentioned that we're already taking the learning from some of the issues in terms of water systems. Mm -hmm. we've, we've done a survey, uh, a literature survey on water systems. There was uh, reports produced looking at sort of water systems, and there's now an action yeah. plan that yeah. is looking at how can we change the yeah. guidance. But I, I also detected that you, there was a suggestion of a more active, routine, yeah. forward-looking yes. surveillance element. Uh, yeah. If I can, so interrupting, if yeah. I can just come in and use an analogy from another sphere. Um, uh, I've been quite interested in fire prevention for many years and looking back into time from Grenfell and before that, many of the changes to legislation has happened after tragic fires when in, in homes for the elderly when people have died and then government has then brought in systems to have sprinklers which has prevented that happening. So using the analogy for contamination, is there something that we can do now with, without waiting for tragedies of people dying or being injured? Mm. Is to, to look proactively at our current situation um, so that we can design our hospitals better, look better, yeah. look at our systems in a more proactive so way. To be, sort of, I think, more specific, so obviously there's an L, so we've talked about the design and the development of guidance. Uh, we've touched on, and Alistair might wish to come in and talk about the inspection regime, uh, which uh, is uh, taken forward on the back of the, <coughs> the monitoring around the data that we do. Uh, the, there is sort of within the, the question that you ask an issue around should we have, you know, because originally we talked about this Legionella issue, mm -hmm. you know, and there's a testing regime for mm -hmm. le le Legionella. Uh, I don't know, and this is the bit that I personally don't know enough about because, you know, I'm not uh, uh, a consultant nurse who works in, in infection control. Uh, but, you know, in terms of what the literature says in terms of your ability to test the environment mm -hmm. for the 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 burden, if you like, and I say test environment, not the, the burden on the individual patient, which we do through point prevalence, uh, but to test the, the built environment through some testing regime. I, I, I don't know the answer yeah. to that question. Perhaps I can try a final question that might um, put a bit more light on the th my theme. Is there any system in place that can pick up invasive fungus-like materials like cryptococcus in the ventilation system before patients become infected? As the Lenny clearly inspection is your uh, job, um, uh, are you aware of anything that would preempt this that might assist with uh, avoiding future such infections? Again, I think you need specialist advice as to what particularly you can put in place. Um, I think, on a more general sense, I, I don't know how helpful it is, but if you would bear with me, I think that the the inspection evidence that we've found over the past 10 years, there was a, a significant issue, obviously, after Veil of Leaving, and then we had the introduction of the inspections. We were finding a lot going on, um, which have subsequently been improved significantly over that period of time. That also includes things like um, improved surveillance of microorganisms such as MRSA and Clostridium difficile. So, I mean, that is improved uh, monitoring at a local level. Um, and we've seen significant reductions in that over a period of time. So I, I would want to, to, to say that the evidence shows that there has been significant uh, improvements. However, there are always things that, that you can do. What's important for me is that um, we have to build um, the ability to monitor, to have surveillance, and then to take action at a local level. You can't inspect that in. You can only use inspection to encourage that and to, to look at it and give you an overall picture. Um, but what really has been important over the past while is to encourage boards and others to develop their surveillance and monitoring system so that they are on top of this day in, day out, and therefore able to take action when it is happening. As for the technical bits about you know what would be required to do that, I, I'm not a specialist and can't answer that. Okay. Anyone else like to contribute? I think. Uh, uh, sorry, I suppose just to build on the uh, the point that although Health Facility Scotland um, uh, is only an advisory organisation, it does provide um, uh, territorial boards with um, a range of monitoring tools, which uh, which they can use in, in in those sorts of circumstances. One that springs to mind is 
um, a system called HEI Scribe, which is the um, system for controlling risk in the built environment. So it's effectively a, a, a tool which facilitates collaboration between the facilities staff uh, within the territorial board and infection control staff. Um, it poses a series of questions um, uh, which are self-assessed. Um, that then comes out with a list of recommendations which can then be prioritised and should boards wish to then share um, uh, their findings from, from uh, the use of that system with other boards. So there is an opportunity for, for that, that, that sort of best practice to be provided. Um, uh, both HPS and HFS contribute to the development of the tool and the tool is provided across all, uh, all N N NHS boards. Okay. Thank you, A couple of brief supplementaries before I uh, move on. Uh, Emma Harper. Thank you. It's just a quick sup. Um, there's already processes in place that look at um, if you're building a new hospital, let's not put uh, a allow birds to nest like seagulls near the dialysis unit that's going to be built. So we'll, we already have these kind of uh, issues in place, I understand. And, and I know that when there's unannounced and announced inspections, you are looking at the environment and you're looking at hand washing and direct observation and peer review is already in process. So the processes are already in place, is my understanding, to look at infection control aspects. So um, am I understanding that correctly? Alistair Lenny. From an inspection point of view, then, then um, we believe that the processes are in place. Um, however, um, if, for example, we visit a, a hospital, we're not necessarily looking at everything at every time. Um, we're using intelligence and evidence to try to target that because hospitals are big, complex organisations. Um, but what we try to do is to take a broad sweep. We are looking to be given assurance by the hospital, by the board, that they are taking these issues seriously and that their systems and governance are in place. And we sample, obviously, beyond that to directly check ourselves to see whether that is actually what's happening on the ground um, or whether the policies are very nice and shiny, but actually that's not what's going on. Um, so from that, we can then identify recommendations for improvement, as we have in a number of occasions recently, um, and obviously, therefore, hopefully improve the quality of safety and care for patients. One thing that's been highlighted to us is uh, who is responsible for plant rooms in a hospital, and are they, are they subject regularly to inspection as part of the inspections that you carry out? Um, not, not directly, um, but uh, if there was an issue that was identified that highlighted that a plant room could be an issue, then the team would go and have a look. But from a generic safe and clean point of view, rather than a specialist you know, um, input, we would be handing that on to others to have a look, a look uh, at. Um, and that's why we need to be able to refer when an issue occurs that we don't have the specialist expertise on the team to look at. Thanks very much. Miles, please. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning to the panel. I just wanted to ask um, very briefly, um, from what you've said, in terms of the number of safety and cleanliness inspections, um, what's the rationale behind why these have halved since 2014? Thank you. <laughs> um, it's not so much a rationale as, as a, a real politic, if you like. Um, the, We've had a number of, of, of issues. I joined the organisation, for example, 18 months ago and undertook a review of our staffing and structure at that point. Um, and we had a number of vacancies, uh, which we have literally just filled. We've had three new inspectors, for example, start in the last six weeks who are in their induction period. Um, but because of the review that I undertook, we had to hold the vacancies over a period of time for HR processes and, and other things. Um, so it took a little bit longer to fill those. We, we also still currently have vacancies that we're advertising. Um, Secondly, we were also, and we are still, testing a new methodology um, because I think it's really important that when we visit a hospital, we're able to look more broadly. As, for example, we did when we went to the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. We took a little bit of a step back and had a look at the bigger picture rather than just on the front line. Um, so we've been looking at that, and I have had to allocate some staff time to be able to allow us to develop that, and that will continue during the year. But I would reassure the committee that, for example, in the coming year, our plans for that will see the numbers of inspections start to move back up again. Also briefly, Alec Hunt. Well, um, I think, good morning to the panel. Uh, Miles Briggs has talked about um, the drop-off in inspections and you cite workforce pressures. I had a workforce-related question as well and that we all know in this committee about workforce pressures across primary care in the NHS. I just wanted to know uh, what impact those pressures are having 
on um, infection control in terms of the responsibilities of, to whom infection control falls um, at a ward level, um, and whether you think that uh, that is there is a direct corollary between um, the infections that we are here to discuss um, and those workforce pressures. Who would like to answer that question? That's a very, very uh, fundamental question, I guess, is to be confident that the people who are required to do these jobs are, are actually in post. Is there any, any of the agencies here with uh, any accountability for ensuring that there are, is an adequate level of staffing to provide safety? Alistair Lane. Uh, um, I would start by saying that if staffing was an issue that was that was directly impacting on patient safety and care, then we would call that out in our reports. Okay, so just to be clear that that, that would be an issue. Um, it was in, in a couple of recent reports, um, as we're aware, and that's exactly what we have done. There is changes going through in the safe staffing bill, which will allow us to have access to a greater degree of um, uh, intelligence and information uh, about staffing levels. And so as going forward, it will become an increasing area that we will be looking at when we're visiting a hospital, because we'll have you know, data that will help us to do that before we go. And we'll be in a better position to be able to understand that. Um, we can look at it when we actually visit, if it's an issue, um, but this will give us more proactive engagement and allow us to check that. At the moment, I don't have information that says, because I don't have the, the evidence to justify it, that says that staffing levels are one of the main themes across what we're finding, say, over the last couple of years. You said that a couple of the reports that have recently come out, you have called that out and said that staffing and pressures on staffing yeah. was an issue in infection control. Was that uh, atypical? Is that is that the first time that's something you cited? Um, it's not the first time, but it, it, it is not um, it is not totally typical. It's not a theme that we I can yet provide evidence on that says that that is a theme occurring across, say, for example, the last two years. I think we've found with a couple of recent inspections that they are very particular to the circumstances that they are there, and I don't, and I would I would hesitate and, and, and ask you not to to necessarily um, extrapolate those across the country. It may well be, as my colleague said about data, it may well be that there, are, there is a trend, you know, um, but at the moment we don't have the evidence to say that that is the case. David Torrance. Convener, good morning, panel. Um, just to let you know, my background's in engineering and I've worked in lots of ventilation systems and plant rooms in my early days. Um, could I ask um, how infection control, such as water and ventilation systems, is uh, managed when you have an outbreak? So, um, I suppose there's two points to that. So, in terms of the, so uh, 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 ultimately, the responsibility for um, a specific healthcare um, a geography or a state um, remains and, and uh, still is the responsibility of that, that board, executive, and, and management team, including the, the professional facilities and states teams um, within the board. Each will have a, a, a regime. Uh, uh, utilising some of the, the tools available from a agencies represented today, um, quite uh, to, to the extent that those are exactly replicated ac across each territory board, I would be able to say. In terms of um, so the, that routine monitoring, uh, the sense of where where there is believed to be an outbreak, that then moves into um, a separate. Um, uh, uh, set of circumstances, uh, including the um, the call of an agency such as HPS, um, uh, where the the um, national framework is then cited, and then that that sets a chain of events in motion where HPS um, uh, will will be asked to um, provide support to the board on that. So, exactly as, <coughs> as Jim has just said, uh, there is the national framework, still colloquially known as the CNO. Algorithm is uh, the chief nursing officer. Algorithm is what is colloquially known as, although it was changed in 2015 to the, the national framework. And that, uh, if a, if a, and a board can can make a call to invite Health Protection Scotland in, and indeed they they do. Uh, equally, H, uh, the Healthcare Improvement Scotland, HEI, the Health, Healthcare Environment Inspectorate, can also call uh, HPS in to provide support. Uh, as indeed can can the Scottish government as is, is, is well, uh, and it and it does happen. I think in the last year it's been invoked, I think five times in in total, which uh, I don't think is uh, exceptional in terms of sort of uh, numbers. But the it's the, it's very much about putting support in place, and some of that support may be about, about almost certainly will be about finding the source, uh, and then figuring out you know. With, with the local board, actually what measures need to be put in place. And there's very strict guidelines around 
you know, the reporting of that and the production of action plans to de deal with that. And I think that is one of the reasons why Scotland has been so effective at controlling uh, outbreaks. And again, this is all based on a lot of lessons that have been learned from previous incidents. Um, you mentioned guidance here um, earlier on, and um, how do health boards adhere to that? Um, because what um, systems are easy to test, the airborne systems or the ventilation systems and airborne infections are very difficult to detect. So how is the guidance relevant for these systems, or do we need updated? And how do health boards actually comply with the guidance you're giving them? Uh, so the the suite of guidance that, that Health Facilities Scotland provide, um, um, previously referred to as the Scottish Health uh, uh, Technical Memoranda, um, wh whilst they are based on UK guidance, they are um, made reflective of the Scottish environment, and they do change over time. Um, as I'm sure committee members are aware, then uh, as as engineering becomes more complex, or as it changes in terms of even things like from um, analog-based systems to digital systems, then the guidance um, has to be uh, reflected on that. So that so the guidance itself never stands still. Um, I think, um, unfortunately, sometimes the guidance does have to re um, reflect on um, incidents that have taken place, and and understand whether that, that guidance then needs to be um, uh, uh, more comprehensively reviewed. Uh, so, for example, we are currently looking at further guidance on uh, uh, technical aspects of water systems that perhaps weren't in the guidance that was written in 2009. Um, so it, it is also that, that constant kind of iteration and learning environment. Um, that it's, it's probably important to say that the distinction between the guidance and um, compliance against the guidance is, what is from, from my organisation, is one that is presumed. So other than small areas where Health Facility Scotland would ask for compliance, we would ask for compliance with um, national cleaning standards and with uh, the decontamination of, of medical instruments. So those are two areas that we currently um, have a compliance aspect against the guidance. Uh, others, again, refer back to, to, to the board's internal management structures and how they, how they use that guidance to best manage their estate. Can I, can I ask um, how often specialist engineers are used um, to test the systems? Because um, they have the ability to do it, um, rather than normal NHS staff. And can I ask also how common is outbreaks of infection from uh, water and uh, ventilation system across Scotland, outbreaks from it? Um, I can certainly answer the first part of that question. Um, I think you're absolutely right that what we are talking about in, in some of these cases is highly specialist technical skills that may not be readily available within the um, NHS Scotland workforce. And indeed, it may not be cost effective to try and have that as an in-house resource. Um, so um, uh, boards and indeed Health Facility Scotland will uh, go to the market uh, and try and get um, expert advice on uh, either on, on current guidance or indeed in, in, in sp uh, particular cases where health boards have required that piece. Um, we're also mindful, though, that there's uh, a balance between um, taking advice from uh, external organisations and being able to use um, that sort of uh, inbuilt knowledge, if you like, and, and, and sharing. Um, very, very recently, um, health boards have asked that they reduce their dependency on um, uh, third-party uh, contractors and increase the uh, level of authorising en engineers that we would use, um, uh, they would effectively um, a hire uh, within NHS Scotland. And that's a process that we're looking at just now, trying to get that balance between ensuring that we have um, captured the best experience in the market at that time, as well as building uh, that kind of in in inner resilience of having a, a single team. Um, and indeed, health boards have asked that that team, if it were to be uh, bought in-house, if I can use that phrase, um, should that then form part of a Health Facility Scotland organisation that they, they can be called uh, back to individual boards. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not able to answer the second part of that question in terms of the kind of consequence of that. In terms of the numbers and the second part of the question, uh, we touched on it earlier that, you know, as part of our uh, submission of evidence, we identified 48 incidents uh, in, the, in the last uh, three years that uh, have been attributed directly to the built environment. I don't have, and I mean, we will provide uh, a breakdown of those to see if we can identify how many were attributable to water ventilation. But as I also mentioned earlier, we, we have done uh, a, a literature research to look at the, the issues internationally to see you know, what the incidence is. And having read those reports, uh, that there are 
similar instance uh, internationally as we, we have experienced recently in, in Scotland. So these incidents aren't unheard of, uh, but uh, we can certainly, if, if it was of use to the committee, provide uh, those uh, reports. That would be helpful. Alec O'Hanlon, further. Uh, thank you very much for bringing me back in, convener. Um, further, this is David Torrance's line of questioning. It's clear from what you've said, and we understand that routine testing for sources of infection is very difficult in terms of ventilation and water supply. Um, and in many cases, the first indicator of an outbreak would be in patient symptoms. Um, can you give us an idea, first and foremost, what the process is then to tracking down the source of that infection when an outbreak occurs on a ward, say? I think you, you would have to ask a specialist. I, I've you know, I don't think any of us uh, have that experience. You'd have to ask a practitioner uh, okay. if, for that. That's fine. Um, second question then, in terms of risk planning uh, around infection outbreak, um, now we're, we're all aware of recent examples where wards are closed. We had a, a ward closed in the Western General just this month um, because of a, a water contamination outbreak. And I imagine risk planning for a single ward being closed is easier than whole hospital uh, contamination. Um, can you talk to us about what, what you do in the event of, or, or your plans are for infection outbreak on a whole hospital level? And secondly, in, the, in terms of mitigation, and we know that a, a hospital recently had to buy tens of thousands of pounds worth of bottled water, that those risk management processes are not actually compounding the issue, that you know where that water is coming from, that it's come from a sterile environment, the rest of it. I think it's important to understand the, the, the governance here. The first part of your question would be down to the to the boards to determine how they respond to, to an incident to to, um, to contain that. I think from an inspection point of view, um, we would be looking to see what plans they have in place. Are they robust? Um, you know, do they make sense? Um, do you know how would they apply them? Do, are, are the responsibilities clear um, at the time? Um, so, from a more generic sense, we would be looking across to make sure that they were actually in a position to be able to control something should it happen. Um, I think as well it might be important just to mention that uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland has the legal power to close a ward to new admissions should we be concerned for patient safety. Um, but it's also important to understand that in the 10 years that we've had that, we have not used it once because actions have been taken while we were on site which satisfied us that you know, sufficient uh, action had been taken and then subsequent actions were obviously taken that we followed up. Thanks very much. Alistair Delaney, again, I wonder if you could uh, elaborate on the comments you made in your report on the Queen Elizabeth Hospital that you had encountered challenges in the relationship between the Estates Department and Infection Control Team. Uh, and I, we've certainly also had evidence from witnesses that, there, that if infection control doctors and nurses likewise appear not to have uh, close working relationships with those managing domestic services in a number of hospitals. So I wonder if you could elaborate on those findings, please. Yes, I mean, I wouldn't want to get into too much detail, but um, obviously we, we, we covered it within the published report, but it was a, f a feature um, of what we found in the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital and its associated um, uh, sites. Um, and it's also something that we would be concerned about across the country as a whole, um, because it is absolutely essential that there is good working relationships between the nursing staff, um, you know, particularly for health and um, for infection control, and the buildings uh, uh, staff. Obviously, in that particular circumstance, we had quite a large backlog of repairs to be done, and the communication was not particularly great around about um, how those were being managed and what happened when they were being reported and potentially having to be reported again. Um, so it demonstrated that that level of leadership governance was really important. The benefit for us in that in inspection was that we were able to stand back and look at that and it became a key feature because the frontline staff were doing as good a job as they could in the circumstances. Um, you know, and we give we give praise to them in the in the actual report. Some of the problems were more systemic um, about governance and relationships. We received evidence also that uh, for example the undertaking of routine maintenance external repairs and external internal maintenance uh, repairs and external maintenance uh, often is done without consultation with infection control professionals within the hospital in question. Is that something, would you ordinarily, as an inspectorate, would you inspect the actions of estates, departments, buildings, maintenance people within the hospital, or would, would that be an, only in exceptional cases like the one you've just described? 
Yeah, it wouldn't be routine. It would be where an issue has been, you know, has been raised. So, for example, if um, uh, in the case that you mentioned, but it applies across the country because it is a cross-cutting theme, I think, with the estate that we're looking at, if you have, um, for example, plaster coming from a wall or you have floor tiles, you know, that are not sealed um, to, to the floor, you cannot therefore say that that room is perfectly clean. You know, it can be cleaned, uh, but you cannot say that that is clean. So therefore, it's essential um, that, that, is, that that is taken forward. If we come across that, we would then f explore that further and try to understand um, what was being done, how the relationships were, um, and what actions were being taken uh, to deal with these issues. And that was exactly what we did in the, the, the case of the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Can I ask uh, Jim Miller and Philip Kaiser to reflect on these points as well? Because clearly, within NHS National Service of Scotland, Health Facility Scotland is responsible for design and commissioning of health service buildings, and uh, uh, Health Protection Scotland is responsible for exactly these kind of infection control and prevention issues. Does, does the relationship between the two divisions of NSS that you represent, is that a, a, a close and daily working relationship? And if it is, why is it not reflected on the ground within health boards? Is there something in the way in which you're dealing with your counterparts in boards, which means that you work closely together, but the people in boards doing your equivalent jobs are not talking to each other at all. Thank you, Convener. I think, um, um, d just to um, a correct point of detail, so Health Facilities Scotland has no responsibility, direct responsibility for design and commissioning of, of buildings or any um, um, healthcare operations. It provides advice to, to those sure, that, that, sure. That, that would... Um, in terms of uh, in terms of the points that, that have been raised, if we look at where that ad, uh, where that advice um, uh, does have a strong uh, connection between Health Protection Scotland, I would maybe cite the example of the development of the um, uh, national cleaning specification. So, national cleaning specification uh, is one area where um, its first iteration was in 2006, and uh, that effectively covered uh, what would probably be regarded as the routine areas covered by um, uh, domestic staff within hospitals. That set a specification and also introduced um, a, a, a reporting regime. The specification itself was developed uh, between HFS staff in conjunction with Health Protection Scotland. Um, it was further extended in 2009 to take uh, um, uh, impact of, of the, 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 the fabric of the building. So not closed systems that we've discussed earlier in terms of heating and ventilation. Um, but those areas that would still be cleaned, but would make, be made more problematic by the, the fabric of the building. So in other words, difficult to clean areas, uh, whether there's pillars or, or, or other uh, obstructions. So I think that's maybe a good example sure. where, the, where the guidance has been, has been co-produced. But can I take you back to the commissioning question? Because, of course, you're right, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, for example, would have been commissioned by Greater Glasgow and, and Clyde Health Board. Yes. But on the basis of your advice on how to ensure these facilities were correctly designed to avoid health protection risks, would that be a fair way to describe your I think it, advice, yeah, we, we would hope that um, uh, all of our uh, territorial board colleagues would call upon the, the advice that's made available through those through those suite of technical memoranda. But, but, but you wouldn't sit down with them at the commissioning stage to say, have you thought about this, have you thought there's about no, that? There's no, for, we, we currently have no formal um, compliance or assurance role in that, it's purely um, uh, technical and advisory, Pure, uh, other than those advisory. two areas that I described earlier. Okay, thanks very much. Philip Kaiser. Just really to comment on the organisational sort of closeness that you, you referenced. So yes, uh, Health Facilities Scotland and Health Protection Scotland sit uh, both as parts of uh, National Services Scotland. That's, I think, academic to the nature of the relationship. I think the relationship would, would be uh, similar in terms of the working relationship, uh, regardless of whether or not they sat in the same organisation. Indeed, uh, Health Protection Scotland work equally as closely with uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland uh, and other partners as well important in this. So uh, NHS National Education Scotland have an important role to play uh, in terms of the education of the, the broader workforce, uh, you know, not just the national, but the, the workforce in boards. Uh, and there are other partners as well, well uh, in this. So it is a quite a complex uh, piece, but I just thought, just to be clear that, you know, I think Jim touched on it, that because we're in the same organisation doesn't mean to say that there, there's a sort of level of integration that there wouldn't be otherwise. But the, the close working that you've described at national level, 
apparently does not is not reflected at local level. Would that be a uh, fair comment? Uh, I, I couldn't say categorically. I, mean, I think obviously that, that there may be instances of good practice and instances of less good practice across across the board. There will be variation across the board. What, what I can say is, you know, because a lot of uh, the role of Health Protection Scotland is that support if there is an outbreak. If there is an outbreak, uh, one of the things that Health Protection Scotland does do will come in and provide guidance around who needs to be in there in in that situation. Admittedly, this is more in the, the reactive uh, situation where there has been an outbreak in terms of pulling together the incident management team that's going to oversee the control if it's a significant outbreak and then there's a need for an incident management team who needs to be around that table you know that the infection control team needs to be there that you do need somebody from estates there so there would there would be guidance and advice offered uh, in that situation certainly thank you very much uh, I think, uh, Sorry, just again to um, perhaps talk about the, the HEI scribe tool that I mentioned earlier. That actually um, contains within it um, um, uh, prompts and suggestions where facilities and infection control teams should work together as they move through that piece of the tool. Um, effectively used, I think, would be um, a, a useful uh, internal challenge, if you like, that uh, whether both uh, parts of the organisation were, 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 were on the same page. So I think the tool does provide and can clearly provide uh, opportunity for that conversation to take place. Thank you very much. Yes. Sorry, and if I may say likewise, uh, we haven't really talked much about the uh, uh, infection control uh, manual uh, that uh, Health Protection Scotland does, which does which does the same from a health protection perspective. And, and then I did reference that we are working on an action plan following uh, some of the issues in terms of water systems, which will look at how those are better managed uh, and provide advice uh, at a board level. But as uh, Jim identifies, it is guidance, and obviously what we can't comment on, and, and maybe that's where the inspection regime can comment, is how that guidance is, is put into place. Thanks very much. Um, Brian Whittle. Oh, thank you. Good, good morning, the panel. I think kind of uh, taking, taking those points uh, forward in terms of, of um, input into uh, into those safety features we're talking about today is, I was wondering, the frontline staff, we've heard a lot uh, um, in a in variety of, of uh, investigations we've done in here is the lack of input from, or the lack of ability from, from frontline clinical staff uh, inputting into uh, various various roles. So what influence do, do they have or what can they are taking of their input, for example, in, in, in facilities management? Because it seems to me uh, they being at the front line would have an important, uh, important input into to, to this, this kind of safety issue. So the um, the, the approach taken certainly in major um, uh, uh, capital projects follows um, very extensive gu uh, guidance published by the Scottish government, um, and throughout the the pathway of that, from um, a, a, a initial assessment of the options through to outline business case and, and indeed final business case, um, encourages a multidisciplinary, indeed a multi-agency approach to that. So I, I do believe that the uh, the guidance uh, encourages an environment whereby all interested parties and stakeholders would be able to input. Um, clearly, I can't comment on the reality of that in terms of what happens uh, with specific instances, but I, I, I would suggest that the, the guidance as it stands um, allows for that opportunity to, to take place. Okay. Um, so, so in, your, in your view, then the guidance would, would give clinical staff some sort of... Um, uh, Shall we say authority to have the concerns raised uh, within this within this environment? Would, would that be your understanding? It's, certainly, it's, in in those examples where I've been more closely involved, um, I have I've, I've seen lots of evidence where um, the the design and operation of a facility, whether that's with, with, within part of a building or indeed a building itself, um, is never done in isolation. I think then the, 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 the question I would ask then is, is where the governance stops. Does the governance stop at board level or, or do your organisations have in, input uh, above what, above the governance of the board? Um, or or you, as you, you, you'd expect the board to de deliver uh, on, on, on the plans that are already in place? Um, 
I think you're probably going to get a slightly different answer from each agency in terms of in terms of the organisation I look after. Then, the governance would stop at board level. We would not we would not expect um, anything to be uh, brought back to us uh, as an organisation. I think it is important to say though that um, um, Health Facilities Scotland does work uh, collegiately with uh, all boards um, uh, via um, a group called the Strategic Facilities Group, which has representatives from Scottish government. Um, all territorial and, and um, uh, national or special boards and representatives of Health Facility Scotland. So they, they don't work in isolation, um, but in terms of the formal, formal governance, there is no formal governance report back into HFS as it stands. I would agree with what Jim said in terms of formal governance. I think one of the important points to stress, though, in terms of the, 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 in shaping that guidance, that guidance uh, in terms of from the Health Protection of Scotland uh, perspective is is shaped very much by our, our experts our specialists who themselves have been frontline staff you know they haven't just gone to university and become frontline staff overnight they they've got a lot of frontline experience and which is why they've they, they now work in health protection scotland they've got that experience that they can bring to bear to shape the the guidance uh, but in terms of the governance question we have no sort of formal governance beyond uh, that guidance other than where we're reacting to uh, an outbreak. Just to say, from our perspective, we are you know we are not part of the governance chain in relation to this either. Um, the, the the boards are obviously the primary governance uh, mechanism, and then upwards from that to Scottish government, um, where we can escalate concerns should we you know need to do that um, if we feel that insufficient action has been taken uh, at a local level. Um, I think one other thing I would mention, not necessarily to do with buildings, but it could be, um, is the Healthcare Improvement Scotland hosts the whistleblowing you know um, helpline and and. Um, other uh, means of gathering uh, intelligence and data from individuals or from groups. And we would do an assessment of that no matter what the subject matter is. It doesn't apply to just what you're looking at here, but it could. Um, and we would then get involved you know, in taking that, that forward as part of a, a potential investigation or it may spark some other kinds of work should that be required. But the first stage would be an assessment. If I could just... I mean, I would be f um, um, had evidence in here on, on the effectiveness of the... The whistleblowing uh, um, uh, within within HS, and, and I think there are, I think it would be fair to say that there would be concerns about that. But I, I, I'm really, I mean, what, I, mean I, I suppose HIS probably the, mo the most relevant um, uh, body here around the, the ability of witnesses or taking evidence from witness front line staff as witnesses uh, and escalating their concerns. So, is it your understanding that 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 is taking place as part of, part of this the investigation? The investigation. Sorry, I'm sorry. Look, you know, the, the, what we're looking at in terms of uh, you know uh, issues around the, Q, the, the Queen Elizabeth. You know, the, the staff st staff are being, or clinic, frontline clinical staff are part of that investigation, and you know through HIS. Uh, I I can't comment on the investigation clearly. We, our expectation would be um, more generally that frontline staff are essential in terms of you know feeding their their views and their information in. Um, we would expect to see that uh, on inspection. We would be asking frontline staff about how their uh, thoughts and ideas and views are, are taken into account in terms of taking things forward. And um, we would always do that. Um, you know we. We have that mechanism by which, if we have a concern, that we can escalate it um, through the boards and then further onwards if we wish. Um, if it was a complaint, then obviously that should be handled in the, in the normal way, which would be through the board's complaint procedures and then on to the SPSO. Um, but we do have that whistleblowing you know, um, line as well, um, should people feel that they're not being satisfied within that. But I can't comment directly on the, the ongoing investigation. We've had evidence that microbiologists and indeed infection control doctors within Greater Glasgow and Clyde have become whistleblowers because that seemed to them the only way they could uh, achieve uh, change in things they considered a, uh, to be an issue. Is that something that would concern Healthcare Improvement Scotland? And if so, what would you do about it? Yeah, yes, it would concern us. Um, and if that was coming through to us, I, I obviously don't want to comment on any details, but if it, well, that was coming through to us, it depends on what it was, but we would be looking to take that up with the organisations concerned. There are individual complaints you know, that may be looked at individually, but something like that would be more of a trend that we would then be uh, asking for an explanation as to why the staff felt that way from the relevant board. 
Thanks very much. Philip Cater. Just to pick up on what Alistair was saying in terms of how, because doesn't, this doesn't just sit with uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland, how the sort of national agencies would, would come together to maybe pick up some of this uh, that might be considered softer intelligence rather than hard data in terms of numbers. So there is a group called the Sharing Intelligence for Health and Care Group that's got some members here may, may be familiar uh, with it. Uh, it has a broad remit. Uh, I've sat through a few uh, meetings of it, and each of it's mostly scrutiny bodies. Uh, my organisation, so I have both Health Protection Scotland and Information Services Division uh, in the business unit that I'm director for. Uh, so we come and we, we bring our evidence, other bodies, Care Inspectorate, Audit Scotland, uh, National Education uh, Scotland come. Uh, a range of different uh, bodies come and they share the evidence that they've got. And there's an opportunity through that group to uh, engage with boards and, and raise and raise issues. And, and some of the softer evidence that you might get through sort of whistleblowing uh, could be uh, considered uh, in that group. Emma Harper. So just to pick up a wee sup, um, Brian Whittle's question was about um, what influence do clinical staff have over facilities management? So I'm aware that NHS and Fruits and Galloway have an environment team that is infection control leadership led with facilities management and clinical staff on the same group and they all work together to identify issues that might be potential infection control issues. So I guess my question is, if we're pulling back from just the Queen Elizabeth and looking at all the facilities that are NHS facilities and hospitals across Scotland, I'm assuming each board has equivalent kind of groups that will meet and discuss and work together and then escalate issues if needed. So we've got the facilities people and the infection control leadership and clinical staff all talking to each other. Is that a fair assumption? Do we have any evidence that that is or is not the case in any particular part of the country? Uh, again, I'm sorry to, to have to say that. I, I, I don't know. Clearly, you'd have to... I, I, um, my my instinct would suggest that the, the, the way that um, I see best practice shared across um, uh, facilities colleagues at boards is it that if something was working well, then they would let other board colleagues know. Um, I couldn't give a, 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 the, the committee an assurance that such a thing was replicated 14 times across the, the 14 uh, territorial boards as they stand. I think that would be a question for each board, unfortunately. Can I just ask Ian Brodie in terms of Health and Safety Executive, just to be clear, we've heard... Uh, various questions and answers around what would prompt different actions on the part of the inspector, the environmental and healthcare environment inspector, uh, and what role the other bodies here might play. What would prompt you to investigate a systemic uh, failure uh, leading to compromising of health and safety in a healthcare environment? Um, I've been very careful not to share it with my area of responsibility during the questions and answers here today. Um, we, we do have an interest in in NHS Scotland and the boards and to go back to one point there is we would also see the boards as the the, the body who would be held accountable for any failures and, and who should be managing the risks that are created as a part of that activity but the large um, portion of our work is is focused on um, health and safety and traditional health and safety issues um, and we do inspect um, health boards and we do investigate um, but not so much on the area of healthcare acquired infection, which is the, the substance of today. The, there is um, occasions, there are occasions when we do get involved in healthcare acquired infection matters, but there's a very clear set of um, guidelines about when that would and wouldn't be. Ordinarily, they're not reported to us, um, which is a trigger for us to be involved, but you'd, we'd then be looking at um, a, an outbreak where there's evidence of clear standards which have failed to be met, where there's evidence of systemic failures failing to meet those standards, and, and where there is a, um, a clear um, evidence that that outbreak has resulted in a death or... The two would bring that evidence to your attention? O ordinarily, it would normally come to attention by the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service, um, but, but obviously member, employees and members of the public are entitled to raise concerns with us through our concerns advice team also. And for example, of a formal connection to but the healthcare environment that, inspector. That comes such. back to the agreement we talked about earlier on, is we do have an agreement in place with yep. the healthcare environment inspector. Yep. And if, if we do, if our inspectors are out and identify issues which fall within HIS's remit, there are mechanisms in place to notify HIS. 
and likewise, and then depending on the subject matter, will depend on how we'll take that forward, either collaboratively or individually. So, so there's mechanisms in place, and, and, and certainly talking for HSE inspectors, they're very clear on what, what HIS's role is and what subject matter should be referred on to them. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and another question for Alistair Delaney is around, uh, and uh, indeed possibly for Jim Miller, around the evidence we've received that health facility standards uh, against which inspections are made uh, can be seen as confusing by healthcare professionals. So, for example, the suggestion that uh, current standards apply to new build, but that they don't apply to existing premises, that's come back um, in some of the evidence as a perception uh, within uh, uh, health personnel. Can you confirm whether the currently ex uh, existing standards apply to pre-existing buildings, to older buildings, uh, and, and be very clear as to what is and is not expected uh, in terms of standards? Um, so, generally, convener, I would say that where a standard is updated, um, it takes cognizance of whether it should be um, prospective or retrospective. Um, uh, and on the majority of cases, um, this the standard would be um, for for moving forward for a prospective. Um, uh, that's not to say that if the if the change in standard or the change in um, design regulations was such that it had to be retrospective that it wouldn't be considered, but very often there's a cognizance of um, um, the impact of such a change and, and the consequential impacts of that. So, for example, um, if there had been a change in in relation to uh, say fire safety regulations or other regulations that, that would require extensive retrospective uh, treatment as opposed to prospective treatment then a, a judgment would be made on that basis but if i look at the last um two or three changes that have gone through then they've always they've they've not been retrospective so does that mean to take a complex site with buildings of different age i i think immediately of forester hill and aberdeen but there are other sites which would likewise have old and new, new buildings. Uh, does that mean that there's a whole variety of different standards apply in different parts of that campus? Um, well, th th they're not different. different well, sorry, um, I, I try and answer the, the question precisely. Um, there, is a, there is a possibility within a large estate that uh, the, the technical advice provided, say, from one decade to the next would would differ. So so yes, in, in that precise case, if I think of um, the speed at which the technical memoranda change, um, it's not as if they're changing, you know, every every week or every month. Um, they do last for a for a period of years. So I think there is a potential that uh, one uh, an older piece of the state would have referred to a memoranda that may have since been updated. And can I ask Alistair Delaney then in inspecting against the standards, does that variety cause any particular challenge for your your teams uh, if they're inspecting different premises on the same site uh, against different standards? I think the, the benefit is you'll know that before we ever go anywhere near the site. So we're, we're aware of any differences that there would be there. Um, and I think in terms of your initial point about confusion, um, uh, I think it's important for everyone to understand that we are, we are using the, the standards which are developed by HPS and HFS rather than um, us developing something ourselves. Um, and so there is one set uh, for everyone. But obviously, if we we're going to a site, we would understand the differences before we ever went there. Okay. Thank you very much. Alice Briggs. Thank you, Convener. Um, I wanted to follow in uh, the line of questioning with regards to new builds in the NHS Scotland estate. And specifically, given the cases that we've seen um, over recent years and certainly in recent months, is it fair to say that we've seen substandard works and construction in some of these new builds? Who would like to answer that? Is there evidence that new development has not taken into account all of the matters that you've described this morning? So I think if I take the... Um, uh, trying to understand the hierarchy of, 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 of guidance versus standards versus re regulations, so the, 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 the function of the SHTMs, the, the, the technical memoranda, is predominantly guidance. The guidance is written um, with reference to standards or codes of practice and indeed uh, regulations, but it doesn't repeat them because they sit in statute or, 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 or otherwise. So that again would be 
clearly the responsibility of the commissioning organisation, whoever that may be, um, ordinarily a territorial boards, to ensure that they had full compliance with everything from regulation down. Um, the guidance as it stands is, is the perhaps a, a, a route to compliance, so that if the guidance is there, then you can see that you have to comply to those um, uh, regulations, uh, uh, standards and approved codes of practice that exist. And given what we've seen, you think that's not being followed then, that we're seeing these cases? So I'm, I'm unable to comment as to whether um, the, the, the guidance as it stands. So the guidance as it stands is there for health boards um, uh, to use and to rely on, but not in isolation. Um, I couldn't comment as to whether um, cases of, of, of uh, projects that have been completed, you know, would would have um, uh, would fail a compliance test if there was such a thing, because of course there isn't a, a compliance test against that guidance. Um, clearly, where there is, is that those next levels up in that hierarchy against a code of practice or a regulation or, or a standard, and, and I'm not aware of any any failings in those aspects. Uh, if I may, uh, I, I mentioned at the start that the, the, cha the, the na changing nature of the built environment, the standards are changing. So I can't comment, uh, as Jim can't either, on the, the standard of building. But, for example, uh, we have seen a, a, a shift to single rooms, and that's admirable in so many senses. Uh, you know, and I, I'm sure a lot of uh, patients really appreciate uh, the, the greater number of single rooms uh, available. However, it does come with a, a change in the nature of the risk in that if you're looking at water systems and each room has its own sink, mm -hmm. then whereas, dare I say, in years gone by, you may have had a much less number of sinks in a, a ward with a number of patients, clearly the level of risk will be different if, if you, as almost an unintended consequence, if you like. So, like I said, we, we are, I think, a learning system. So, we... We perhaps, you know, could we have anticipated maybe some of the issues concerned with that? Perhaps, with, with the power of hindsight. But we are responding to that and, and learning uh, from the, the changing nature of this. I just give that as, as one example. And, you know, given um, the responsibility as far as we're aware is then to the 14 health boards to sign off these projects with your support, um, is there a need for that to be reformed and looking towards specifically dedicated expert infection control teams to be part of that? It doesn't sound like we have 14 dedicated teams doing that for new builds across the country. And so it sounds like it's very patchy to say the least. Is that is that right in terms of my interpretation then of what we're doing today when we look at new builds before NHS Scotland takes ownership of them? I think I would um, I would I would comment that um, I suppose picking up on Phil's point that, that in terms of that that continual learning environment I know from work that is currently going on at that um, a group that I referenced earlier called the Strategic Facilities Group um, they're continually trying to understand how they can uh, they can better work I think it's um, uh, and <coughs> the comment was made earlier today that, that the the incidence of very large um, uh, complex hospital builds um, is relatively small. Um, uh, which means that that sort of um, shared learning opportunity becomes quite difficult. So it may be once every 10 years, indeed it may be once in a career for a lot of people working on a territorial board that are involved in that project. So I think the, the facilities groups and other agencies are looking to see, so how can you gather that, that uh, how can you ensure that shared learning from one project to the next um, isn't lost? Mm -hmm. I think that's important. You know, for myself as a Lothian MSP, we have um, the new Royal SickKids, um, same construction company, but obviously different design sets have been in place. And so, you know, we hope we see no incidents in the new hospital, but the guarantees we need to see and any retrospective fitting, for example, which needs to take place, how that's then followed through, I think is important. Finally, I just wanted to ask, because we've, we've been um, asked to maybe refer to specialists um, by the panel, do we have these specialists in Scotland today who can do this work when we're looking at ventilation specialists, for example? Who do you use um, when you're undertaking this work? I'd probably refer back to my earlier comment. Um, we, we have, um, certainly if I look at the, my own um, area, we do have a number of specialists, whether, whether that covers absolutely every aspect of the built environment, um, I, I wouldn't like to say. Um, uh, However, I think it would be um, it, it, 
it's important to recognise that both boards and indeed Health Facility Scotland uh, do rely and do go to um, uh, external marketplace to make sure that we are providing uh, that advice, that cutting edge advice from others. The literature review that Phil referenced earlier to a, a, an earlier uh, committee question uh, is also making sure that in, in terms of other healthcare systems, uh, indeed out with the UK and Europe, that we're trying to get that best practice. So there's something about the technical expertise, and I think there's also something about the, um, the almost that scientific expertise that's provided that, that, that informs the guidance. And can you say, in, I know from some of the correspondence I've received, and I'm, I'm sure other members um, across the Parliament have, um, the construction sector know each other and often um, in a competitive world will um, talk about each other. But I know from some of the correspondence I've had, which I've raised with the Cabinet Secretary, ongoing concerns. Um, do you ever um, instigate discussions around concerns which are raised earlier um, before NHS Scotland take ownership of, of these buildings? So whether, it, whether it's a concern, whether it's a reflection, whether it's an observation, um, it, it, I, I, and again, I'm sorry, it sounds like it depends, but it does depend on, on that, the, that um, the ongoing relationship, if you like, or ongoing conversation between the, the board or the commissioning organisation and HFS. Um, on the whole, I do believe that there's a strong collegiate working relationship, but um, sometimes there's the case where we need to understand the respective roles and responsibilities um, and where a, a, a board has made a decision to take forward a project, um, then we have no automatic uh, right, if you, if you like, in terms of, of, of that sort of scrutiny piece. Back to the earlier comment around that kind of guidance and advice versus the um, audit compliance uh, piece uh, that we currently don't have. Final, final uh, question. In terms of these projects then, do you ever have concerns around projects being awarded based on savings, potentially? I, I'm, I'm genuinely not aware of any um, uh, a project or contract that, that's awarded w through a single lens, if I can use that phrase. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Convener. Just a brief follow-up on Miles uh, Briggs questioning about specialists. I'm acutely aware that as we uh, are changing the model of care that we are delivering in terms of building new hospitals in a different way than we used to, um, that there are unknown unknowns not to get old donald rumsfeld but this uh, a knowledge gap might therefore exist i mean we may have you know, specialists who know forensically how to keep uh, a sink apparatus clean in a, in a bedroom or how to clean and keep air duct units functioning in a in a hygienic way but these spe same specialists might not know then for the example the impact of a helicopter landing on a, a helipad which is covered in um, pigeon droppings. Um, are you concerned that there is a knowledge gap and would we know who to ask if we identified through the, the various inquiries on going into incidents um, that, that we do have that knowledge gap? I, I, I'm not concerned there's a knowledge gap insofar as I think I'm reassured that we have a, an open um, a learning organisation that is NHS in Scotland. I think it would be um, uh, crazy to assume that we were uh, we fully understand that, that one of the first things we talked about um, earlier this morning was that fast moving change in the environment and that's not just the way that um, health is operated within its uh, um, uh, construction and build but indeed the way that construction and build moves in other healthcare environments um, we uh, in Health Facility Scotland we have a very strong relationship um, at, uh, both at a UK and, and beyond level to make sure that we have that open uh, learning opportunity that others can learn from us and we can learn from those. And are you confident that um, in terms of infection control, whether that's the specialists or it's the uh, clinicians on the ground or the, the workers on the ground who are charged with infection control, um, are sufficiently have sufficient continuous training um, so that they're on top of, you know, the, we understand there's an arms race really that exists between, um, you know, the developing infections and the, the fact that they become resistant to traditional techniques. Um, do we have a, a comprehensive suite of training to upskill those workforce, that workforce which is um, in charge of infection control with our understanding about the developing nature of viruses and, and bacteria? I'll pick that up if I may. So... We do have a, a programme and it is an integral part. I mentioned earlier on NHS National Education Scotland, uh, who are a key partner uh, in this. So in terms of developing any action plans, we're continually looking at, well, you know, it's no point us just writing a piece of guidance if we then don't think about how do we then take that out to educate uh, frontline staff in its application. 
So it, it is it is most certainly uh, a, a key component. And just if I may just go back to this issue of, of, of the unknown unknowns, if you like, and that surveillance of how, how do we ensure that we, we are trying to keep up with that arms race. Uh, the, I, I did reference earlier the, the, the European figures uh, that, uh, that position Scotland quite strongly, but that, that you know, the, work, working in a UK context uh, and working in a European context and seeing what's going on, we mentioned the, the literature reviews that we've done that are looking at an international context. So that surveillance is going on uh, all, all the time. Mr. Delaney? So just to go back to, to the first point. Well, I think it's um, it's not always about specialist knowledge or training, and sometimes, as we've found recently, it's also about accountabilities and responsibilities and clarity about that, so that as the healthcare environment develops, it can sometimes become unclear who is responsible for, for something. More single rooms, you have therefore more sinks and toilets, but if those are not getting used, for example, who's actually responsible for the flushing regime in relation to that? So I think it's important that the governance, in a sense, keeps up with the development in healthcare. So it's not always just about training, it's also about, I think, being having a clarity amongst all the staff, including ancillary staff, not just clinical staff, uh, about who is responsible for what and keeping those operating procedures, if you like, up to date. Thank you very much. Can I just go back to the question I asked a little earlier about uh, health facility standards, Scotland standards. Can I just confirm with Alice Delaney, it'd be your view that all buildings you inspect reach the relevant standard? That would be your expectation and what you would require to happen? Um, it would be an expectation that the standards are met and we would obviously rather we cannot check every single standard every single visit quite clearly but we would use intelligence and evidence to see um, you know if there's anything to give us thought about looking at something in particular but again that and you would apply that intelligence led approach whether it was existing buildings or new builds absolutely okay, I'm in, thank you, convener. Um, I'm interested in looking at some of the issues around cleaning the environment, for instance, because if we're comparing new builds with older estate, you know, and there's the issues around uh, what makes somebody susceptible to an infection. You know, it's the immunosuppressed, the bone marrow, neutropenic, compromised patients that are the ones that are most at risk. So. If we're talking about new builds and all the pipes and air, well, the same issues is in the, the older estate as well. So cleaning is integral to infection control uh, prevention, actually. So I'm assuming that we've got everything in place to make sure that our cleaners are um, educated, prepared. And, and I know that it is about the not just the clinical teams, it's about everybody having a responsibility to wash their hands, but the cleaning of the environment is essential as well. So I'd be interested in comments about that. I would just go back uh, again to my earlier point. I think that the ancillary staff, cleaning staff, it's absolutely essential that they understand their roles and responsibilities, that they are trained appropriately so they understand what they have to do and why they're having to do it. Um, and that that, uh, that uh, dovetails with the clinical input um, so that they can understand what is required and how they can accommodate the, the work that has to be done. And that is certainly something that we look at on inspection as, as evidenced by recent reports. A report, uh, a national report that's uh, collated by um, HFS on um, uh, compliance to the national cleaning um, uh, specification that I referenced earlier, the, the current 2009 one. Uh, indeed, the most recent report was published um, probably about two months ago, six to eight weeks ago. Um, and that identifies, using a relatively simple sort of red, amber, green, but identifies that allocation uh, adherence to those specifications, as well as those um, uh, uh, um, shared learning opportunities that are created by the, the, the mix of uh, aged estate. Okay. okay. Okay, in one of our submissions, I think I, I read that if a room was visibly clean or it looked tidy, then it might be skipped from cleaning, but it would seem to make more sense to me that you, you can't see microorganisms um, on the bedside locker or whatever, but so a, a regular cleaning a routine would need to be implemented no matter whether a place was visually looked okay. So I would imagine that that would be the best practice. Yes, I, I, I can't remember the absolute detail of the specification, but I would be surprised if it, if it was based on a, a visual uh, only inspection. Um, but I'm happy to, to refer back to the committee on that point. Yeah, we were told that in uh, one hospital, 
Current cleaning conforms to a dynamic risk assessment for the first three days of a patient's stay. Uh, in other words, if it appeared clean, then cleaning would not be carried out on that day. Is that something that would fail an inspection? Um, I think it depends on the context and the circumstances. I think we would be looking for information about how we can be assured and how the hospital can be assured that that area is to a standard which is acceptable. Um, and rather than, than be prescriptive about saying what it has to be, I think we would be asking for assurances as to how that is being managed and how that is being looked at. The same witness uh, told us, and I, I don't doubt that this is correct, that virtually all hospitals in the Western Hemisphere and further afield clean patient rooms or bed spaces at least once a day. But that's not a requirement currently in Scotland, is it? That's not something you would require hospitals to be able to demonstrate. Again, um, apologies, Confirm, I would, I would um, certainly happy to refer back to the committee on the absolute detail of the specification, but I don't have it to mind. Okay, thanks very much. There was another um, witness who talked to us about ventilation and said that, um, gave a, a couple of examples, inadequate ventilation systems have been installed in new build hospitals. These are not fit for purpose for specialist patient groups such as bone marrow transplant and haematology wards, and also said the adoption of positive pressure ventilation rooms, room design throughout a number of Scottish hospitals is inadequate to protect isolated, immunosuppressed and or vulnerable patients. This really follows on from Emma Harper's questions, but specifically on ventilation. Uh, are those uh, approaches to new build hospitals that uh, members of the panel recognise? Jim Miller. Uh, it's not something that I think I could comment on uh, other than to, to suggest that, that it, it, it's a clearly a very technical area and it's not, I don't think there's anyone in, uh, that's been asked for the committee that would have that expertise. Who would, who would uh, make the final choice on uh, equipment and systems such as ventilation? Where does the responsibility for installation or, uh, and choice of a, a, a ventilation system lie? Uh, depending on the model of contract used, uh, it would be the, the, the commissioning organisation. So in the, in the case of a large hospital, it would be the, the territorial board. And do you, as HFS, do you lay down standards that ventilation systems must comply with that are designed to reduce uh, uh, healthcare infect uh, in infections? Uh, do you lay down those standards and are there choices made only within those standards uh, by the commissioning organisation? So uh, uh, back, back to the standards then, in the sense that the, the standards are there um, as guidance, we would expect, th expect them um, uh, to be adhered to. Um, we have uh, and are continuing to use, we've, we talked about the, um, the review of the uh, guidance on water and water systems, just given the, the vast increase in complexity. Um, I think the same could be said for, for ventilation systems and changes to that. So it's an ever-changing uh, landscape, yeah. Is there any evidence that you're aware of where a new build hospital in recent years has disregarded or failed to comply with guidance on these systems? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. Okay, thanks very much. Emma Harper. I'm aware that we, you know, we've already seen um, a massive reduction in central venous access device infections over recent years because we know that you should only put central lines in in an area that's clean with positive pressure environment, like an operating theatre or a clinical room that's only for line insertion. So we're seeing that already. So everybody is aware that there are places where invasive procedures need to take place and, and that's set up as a standard. So I just want to reiterate the fact that, you know, we, we have seen a reduction in line infections or surgical site infections because good clinical practice is in place. And that knowledge is shared based on inspections and uh, and then information that's shared throughout the infection control experts network um, that's I mean I'm proposing that because I know that's a fact right is that something witnesses would confirm Alison Yes, Convener, I, I think that is certainly the case. I think that the improvements have been significant. The sharing of good practice has been strong um, because everyone has patient safety and patient care at their heart. So everybody wants to learn from, from everyone else. So there have been significant strides. There are always going to be places where you know something has not quite gone right. We need to identify those, fix them, and then move forward. Yeah. Philip Kaiser. Perspective. Uh, 
uh, a government level, there's the Antimicrobial Healthcare Associated Infection Policy Group, uh, which obviously Health Protection Scotland uh, support and inform. But they take the policy that comes from, from that and they take it forward in uh, an anti antimicrobial resistance and healthcare, healthcare associated infection group of their own. Uh, and indeed, that is being incorporated as part of the, a broader sort of health protection network. So th there are well uh, established processes for sort of bringing that together and, and sharing uh, to make sure that we are continually updating the guidance that we're providing. Thanks very much. The, uh, Miles Briggs. Uh, just a very brief uh, supplementary. In terms of um, reporting up to Scottish Government in that context, then, is it two cases of an infection in one hospital before ministers are made available? Ministers are made available. Oh, are informed. Uh, I, would, I would have to check the detail of the uh, national framework uh, to confirm that, uh, but it is, it is all well specified. And if, if the committee would like a copy of the national framework, that, that's very re That'd readily supplied. Useful. And do you do any work around the fact, you know, people are in hospital often with um, compromised immune systems. And so in terms of, um, you know, when there is a case of someone uh, dying, the reporting around that, whether or not hospital inquired infections played a direct part in that. In terms of the figures, I don't think it's necessarily clear sometimes around, um, you know, a death certificate, for example. That information would be available. I'm not sure in terms of how readily uh, available that is. Uh, but if the, if the committee particularly wanted to find out more about that, certainly that is something that, that we could take away if you wanted uh, some, some data around the, the level of mortality attributable to uh, healthcare-associated infection. Thank you very much. Uh, before I bring in Brian Whittle, one specific point arising from the British Medical Association submission. Uh, they questioned the need for Scotland to have its own guidance for healthcare premises and said that uh, one, one of the consequences of that separate guidance was that it was harder to get external experts and training for what's a relatively small market. Now, we already had some discussion around that question of external experts. Is that, is that a point that is recognised? And if so, what would your response be? Um, Jim Miller. It, 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 two, two comments, if I can, convene us. As, uh, first, an answer to that specific question, the, the guidance. Um, if it's based on UK guidance, is, is changed as little as possible, uh, and in some cases not changed at all. It's only changed to reference if there's a different regulatory regime in Scotland than there is in, uh, in other parts of the UK, or if there's something a, a fundamental change in, in healthcare practice, such as the um, incidence of single rooms that uh, Phil mentioned earlier. So the, the, the changes are not, um, it's not a rewrite, it's just to make sure that it's appropriate to the Scottish context. Um, I, I, sorry, convener. I wonder if I could just um, go back to a, a, a point that was that you asked earlier uh, around a, um, a adherence to the to the guidance. I've just in, in checking my notes. There is a, a, a current um, internal report uh, between HFS and uh, um, Greater Glasgow and Clyde for their consideration, where it talks uh, on at least one occasion that I can see from my note that adherence to the uh, technical memoranda is is not possible. Uh, um, to be absolutely confirmed uh, that it meets the requirements um, and it's asking uh, Glasgow for comments. I just want to clarify, I think my comment was not to my knowledge, so there is something that suggests that uh, we have asked the question of, um, uh, of the board when, they, when they'd invited us in. But it appears that they may have fallen below the standards because they say they can't implement the standards. It's, it's, it's not they can't implement standards, it's when we have looked at uh, a particular um, piece of uh, water pipe work um, that we are, we, we are not able to confirm that it meets the standard, perhaps because, uh, and again, I'm not a technical expert, but maybe because it's a closed system and we can't yep. confirm. Yep. Understood. Thanks very much. Brian Hurdle. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, we, we understand that there's, uh, currently at uh, the Queen Elizabeth are sitting at around about uh, 300 uh, maintenance jobs uh, as a backlog. I just, just a point of clarity, is, is that, uh, is that uh, what you would expect for, from, a, from a hostel of that age and, and size? Is that, is that normal? From our side, we saw that that number is quite high. Okay, and with, with that, the, the, the question then, does that then potentially pose a threat to, to patient care then, that kind of maintenance backlog? It, well, anything like that would potentially um, um, uh, pose a risk to patient care. The question is how, how responsive the board are to uh, 
um, the maintenance backlog and how responsive they are to dealing with them. Um, they need to prioritise that list, um, obviously, and that's what they've done, um, so that they can focus on the areas of highest <laughs> risk and make sure that progress is made. Um, and in relation to that, as you'll see from the report that we published, the board provided an action plan about how it was going to deal with all the recommendations, including that as, as one. Um, so they are taking forward things to our satisfaction as it stands at the moment, and obviously we will check their progress at a later date. I think that one of the questions you would ask then is, is, is maintenance given uh, the pro priority and the funding uh, that it potentially deserves? That would be, <laughs> that would be a, a decision well above my pay grade as to whether they're sufficiently funded to do so. Okay. When, when you say that the priorities have been set by Greater Glasgow, um, do we know how they've, or what process they've followed to set those priorities? Um, I, I couldn't be able to give you detail about how they did that. But yes, we would um, be asking um, the board how it has set those priorities. And obviously, patient safety and care would be at the very top of that list. Brian Hurd. I think further to that, uh, Camille, I think, I mean, are, are maintenance jobs at the Queen Elizabeth still responsible, are responsible for the health board, or does the contractor still uh, retain some of that responsibility? Um, I, I don't know in detail, but it's not, a, as I understand it, colleagues, a better place. It's not a PFI build, so I think the responsibility lies with uh, the health board to make those those improvements. I would I would note that the 300 is across all the sites, as you mentioned earlier, not just the the new build. Um, and obviously, some of the older build, you know, has significant issues by its very nature, which is what was your original question, which does make it difficult. Um, and we all understand that, but that's the position that we're in in, in, in the country at the moment. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Emma Harper. Just to pick up on Brian Whittle's question, that if 300 um, maintenance jobs are, uh, are required, some of them might be as simple as a light bulb change. So that wouldn't be an infection control issue. So prioritising them on severity of risk, red, amber, green, red bean, you really need to do this right now, would need to be part of the consideration. And I'm aware that there are facilities monitoring tools that are used to help monitor the facilities. But some are the contractor's responsibility. Like if a sluice was required um, in a particular clinical area, because maybe in the original design build, it wasn't in the right place, that is a bigger job than changing taps or sinks or light bulbs. So that has to have a, a maybe a more planned process of of uh, engagement so that that would then need to be have a different priority i'm assuming i mean clearly you're absolutely correct they're not all of the same order i mean the, the, the number itself doesn't tell you a huge amount um, because it depends on the nature of what those things were um, and some of them are easily fixed can be done immediately some of them uh, would take a longer uh, term but also some of them are more important than others um, when you look at patient safety. So absolutely the case. You would have to delve into the detail to be able, be able to understand better what those things actually amounted to. I think I understood your previous answer to say that you would you would ask Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board um, how they'd set priorities. And that would include presumably asking who had been involved in the setting of priorities. Of course. And so we would be we would be checking that to make sure that there, there is a prioritization and a rationale for that prioritization. And, and, and that it involves clinical staff and of not course. only the state staff. Of yeah. course. Okay, understood. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Brian Whittle, did you have one you wanted no, to come finished. back on? Okay, excellent. Thanks very much. My last question, we, we've already touched on uh, the issue of whistleblowing and so mm -hmm. on, um, and I wondered, uh, and, and, and the fact that members of the clinical staff have felt the need to go to become whistleblowers in order to draw attention to concerns they have. In your, are any of your organisations the type of organisations to which people can go who are members of the public or members of uh, hospital staff and direct their complaints or their concerns directly and with a consequence that you will do, be able to do something about it? Alistair Delaney. Uh, yes, um, it is possible. However, the, 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 the issue that people have to understand, and it's always a difficulty for us, is that people raise their individual concerns about their individual treatment. Sure. And if that's the case, it's a complaint 
to the board, which they have to follow that process, which then goes to the Scottish Public Sector Ombudsman um, thereafter if they are unhappy with that complaint. Um, and we can't get in the way of that process. So we do have uh, members of the public who contact us, but we have to then take that and extrapolate it out and ask if there are generic or general issues um, which are applicable across a wider range rather than investigate an individual circumstance. We do use it in intelligence, however, because um, we get that kind of information. We can see if there are trends or if there are issues building up over time in a particular area, and we can use that to inform further action that we can take. So that would be a piece of advice. Ian Brodie. Similar answer, yes, people can raise, members of the public, employees, staff can raise concerns with us and there's information on the website, but they would be triaged against our regulatory model and where our area of jurisdiction rests. That's, that's uh, I'm sure, very helpful for uh, members of the public and particularly concerned members of uh, medical staff to understand. Uh, you've, you've mentioned um, on a number of occasions that you felt that the expertise that we were seeking to access wasn't uh, within your particular territory. So this is a very general question uh, to ask if uh, there are other witnesses or other organisations you feel we ought to hear from in order to address some of the questions that we've discussed today but not fully resolved. Would there be any nominations from the witnesses of other witnesses from whom we ought to hear? It, it would depend on the specific question. I mean, and sure. so, I mean, obviously, we've covered a range of questions from high-level strategic organisational issues, which I, I think the, the panel are, are equipped to deal with, down to some very sort of specialist uh, sort of issues, which actually we're, we're not e equipped to, to deal with. Uh, you know, I think in all of our organisations, we rely on quite a large number of staff to have that, that collective knowledge. So uh, it would depend if, if the panel particularly, if the committee particularly wanted to explore a specialist topic in detail, then perhaps we could advise. But given the range of questions that we've had, it's quite mm -hmm. difficult to to identify a in particular witness, uh, that the, certainly from from a health protection perspective, uh, un, unless there was a particular topic that the committee wished to explore. Thanks. I would, uh, Mark yeah, Spriggs. You know, when we're talking about 14 health boards, in your experience, is there one you think is getting this right in terms of inspection and looking towards this and, and future-proofing the NHS estate? The, I mean, if you look at the figures, uh, some boards are doing better than, than, than others. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not a secret that actually, I mean, we've talked quite a lot about Glasgow and, and the, some of the concerns about the, the Queen Elizabeth. Actually, if you look at Glasgow as a health board, they actually are doing better than the, the Scottish average. Uh, so, and again, I just say that to sort of try and put things uh, into context. Uh, there, there will be pools of, 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 of good practice that, that uh, can, can be drawn. But again, it depends because some boards will be good at some particular areas of practice and others... You know, again, if, it, if it's, for example, if it's in terms of commissioning uh, new hospitals, again, that's a difficult one to call because they do it so infrequently. Uh, but there will be other examples. So I, I'm, I'm sure, depending again on the area which you wish to explore, that you, you could find a board that was a, a, an exemplar compared to the rest. Thanks very much. There will be the official report of this session will be published later today. I would uh, ask witnesses to reflect on the questions that were raised during the session and, and, and not, not fully answered and, and, and by all means come back to us if other thoughts occur to you in, in those terms. You also, I think a number of you have uh, promised to provide further information. be very grateful if that could be available by Tuesday. I know that's uh, quite soon in terms of working days, but uh, it would be helpful to us if we were able to uh, have access to any further information you've offered to provide uh, by, by, by this time next week. Uh, thank you all for uh, your answers to the many questions we have raised. It's much appreciated. I will now uh, suspend this session and we will resume in private session in five minutes' time. Thanks very much.